Perfect target, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get started. So today we're starting a new section, the uh, respiration section, respiratory section, thinking about um, exchange of blood gases. And so we've done a fair amount of work on regulating or um, working with a regulated variable, mean arterial pressure. That was what all of the work we've been doing so far has been focused on. But there are, and so now, based on what you did on Tuesday, you're starting to get really good at seeing how the whole system works as a unit in order to solve mean arterial pressure problems. So there are other regulated variables. So we're now going to segue into thinking about other regulated variables. Oxygen, um, CO2 is going to be the focus of the respiratory section. <coughs> We need to get re respiration under our belt because, CO, uh, because we want to regulate hydrogen ion, but CO2 is critical in regulating hydrogen ions, so we got to think about CO2 first. Then we can move to hydrogen ion. Once we have all that, then we can go back to regulating them all within, uh, within a single problem, okay? So getting ourselves, working ourselves slowly to whole body regulation. Okay, so we can then start to solve problems like you're in left heart failure, what happens to all of these variables? And how does the body then respond to bring all those variables back to normal? Okay, that's where we're headed. But we need to get a little bit of respiration under our belt first. So the primary goal of the respiratory system or respiration is to bring blood into very close contact with atmospheric air. Okay, that's the whole goal of the structure, is in a very controlled way, bring blood into close proximity to atmospheric air. So the primary role is The primary role is to bring blood in very close proximity to atmospheric air. And more importantly, the gases in the atmospheric air. Okay, ultimately for exchange with those gases. So, a little functional anatomy here. Let's get down uh, the anatomy that we need to know in order to understand the physiology behind it. So, how do we bring that air in to the system to get it into close proximity with our, uh, with our bloodstream? We bring air in through a trachea. So, just a fancy tube. Okay, this trachea is made up of cartilaginous rings, so uh, rings that uh, add rigidity to the tube to help, so we prevent collapse. Collapse of this tube would be catastrophic. So we add, we add um, cartilaginous rings so collapse doesn't occur. But then also there's smooth muscle there as well, so you can control the diameter of that, uh, of that trachea. So the trachea is made up of those uh, cartilaginous rings. So rings of cartilage, this is going to add rigidity, rigidity, R-I-G, um, I think that's how you spell it. That'll be the Thursday spelling of rigidity if that's not true. Uh, and this is going to prevent collapse of the trachea. It also contains smooth muscle, so we control we can control the diameter of the tube. Okay, 
the tube is lined also with epithelial cells and goblet cells. So the epithelial cells uh, and uh, specifically the goblet cells secreting mucus, right, to catch any particles in the air that we brought in, okay? So we're kind of starting this little bit of a filter process in terms of uh, the air that we're bringing in. So we have a tube with epithelial cell, lined with epithelial cells and goblet cells. Um, specifically or importantly, these goblet cells secrete mucus. In order for us to help trap foreign particles that we might be bringing in. So we bring in air into this trachea, and importantly, the length of this trachea and bringing um, uh, air in through uh, the branches of this trachea, like the bronchi, warm the air and hydrate the air. So we kind of got to prepare this air, especially in Canada, where you can have, in the summer, very warm, humid air that you're going to bring in, and in the winter, very cold, dry air that you're going to be bringing in. So the body can't rely on the air coming in being of a certain hydration status or being of a certain temperature. So the system then has to take care of itself and say, okay, I have to have a system where I can completely warm this air before it hits my blood, and it completely hydrates the air before it hits the blood. Okay, so critically, by the time you hit the bronchi, branches of the trachea, the inspired air is 100% saturated with water and it's warmed to 37 degrees. So 100% saturated with water and warmed to body temperature, 37 degrees, okay? So we do have, if we think about that tree for a minute, and how we're bringing that air in, that one trachea that we've just talked about, large, about diameter of about two centimeters, lined with epithelial cells. There's cartilage, smooth muscle, and goblet cells. Okay, we just highlighted that up top and why we have those things. We then diverge this tree. Okay, the tree will go undergo divergence into uh, two bronchi that will also be uh, made up of similar, or have a similar structure, epithelial cells, goblet cells, cartilaginous cells, smooth muscle. Okay, and then as we move, uh, as we continue to diverge into 200 bronchioles, so we're starting to get a little bit smaller, diameter much smaller, and we start to lose some of those layers. Okay, having, because again, we want, we're ultimately going to want a layer that's optimal for exchange. When you've got um, goblet cells and smooth muscle and cartilage sitting there, that is not optimal for diffusion or for exchange, right? So as you move down this, uh, this tree, we start to lose certain characteristics. So the bronchioles have no cartilage, okay? They, do, they have less smooth muscle and fewer goblet cells, but they still have those epithelial cells, okay? And then this tree then terminates into alveoli, huge number of alveoli of very small diameter. So these alveoli are like small sacs or they kind of look like grapes hanging off of the end of a, uh, the end of the bronchioles, a little picture of it here, where you only have a layer of epithelial cells, okay? So you've stripped everything else off so that now you just have a tube, blind-ended tube, that is a layer of epithelial cells, right? So if we look at 
part of this blind-ended tube, we would have a layer of uh, epithelial cells. And they are attached to a basement membrane, right? So they gotta, they got to sit on something. So they're attached to that basement membrane. And on the other side of that basement membrane are the endothelial cells of the pulmonary capillary bed. Okay, so on the other side, attached to that basement membrane are epithelial or endothelial cells. Of the pulmonary capillaries. So we have a blood side, right, the compartment where we have the blood, the capillaries, in very close proximity to air. Okay, and we've stripped off everything other than an epithelial cell layer to be able to maximize um, diffusion between these two compartments. Okay, so that's the game afoot. The game afoot is to get air into these alveoli so that we can then exchange between these two major compartments. Okay, so this is us creating a structure to bring a, uh, blood into very close proximity to atmospheric air. Okay? So the basement membrane itself is not very thick. This is a very, endothelial cells and epithelial cells will be approximately one micron thick. The basement membrane uh, is approximately 0.5 microns thick. So you're looking at a maximum microns thick, so you're looking at something which is about three microns thick in total, okay? Which is what we need if we want diffusion to rule the day, okay? Now the other thing that's happened here, so not only have we stripped those layers off to optimize for exchange, we have diverged into a massive number of these alveoli, okay? So we need a huge surface area for this exchange to occur. And in fact, if you were to um, take out all your alveoli, so don't try this at home, but if you were to take out all of your alveoli and lay them out, okay, take each one of those grapes and lay them out flat, you would end up with a surface area the size of a tennis court. It's massive, 70 meters squared right here. Okay, so the the, we are hugely vulnerable to what we've just done here. We've exposed our blood to the tune of the size of a tennis court to atmospheric air, okay? This is what we need, though, in order to be able to optimally exchange oxygen in the air with blood, okay? So this is the structure we need. It does make us a little bit vulnerable to things we breathe in, but we have to deal with that. So ultimately, the reason for diverging from one trachea to three million alveoli was to optimize the area for exchange. Okay, so the area for exchange is approximately 70 meters squared in terms of surface area. 70 meters squared, you gotta think about that number, tennis court, okay? Massive surface area that we are now, that we have for exchange, okay? So that's the structure. Question then is, is how do we get air in? Air is not just gonna magically move in, we actually have to move air on purpose, okay? So here's the structure we're gonna bring air into, we now have to focus on the physiology of it. How do we get air in? And you'll be happy to know that it is our old friend flow equaling P1 minus P2 over R. This time though, we happen to be talking about air flow. We've been talking a lot about blood flow and how a pressure drop changes blood flow and resistance 
uh, is inversely proportional to blood flow. Well, the same uh, rules are going to apply for air. In order for air to move, you need a pressure drop and that you can create a resistance that will decrease flow. Okay, so here, let's just remember that we are talking about air now. That'll be our focus. Okay, so obviously then, if this equation is telling us that the determinants of airflow are going to be a, a pressure drop and resistance. So now we have to explore each one of those things. We have to explore P1, we have to explore P2, and we have to think about R, okay? Because there's nothing else is going to be dictating what flow is going to do. It's just going to be these three variables. So first let's talk about resistance because that's not going to play a huge role in um, changing airflow. It can under pathological situations. Anyone with asthma knows this very well. Okay, you can under pathological situations, but under normal healthy situations, we have a little control over resistance. Um, but not used on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And obviously, we're talking about a tube, right? So by changing resistance, we're gonna change the diameter of that tube, okay? And where we lose some control here is those cartilaginous rings trying to help keep this thing open, okay? Interesting thing about the trachea is it has these cartilaginous rings, right? And then it has these rings of smooth muscle, but if you contract, the smooth muscle is between the cartilaginous rings, so obviously if you contract that smooth muscle, you can't actually force the cartilage to get smaller, right? So you would think, okay, so there's no ability to change diameter of this tube. Well, the cartilaginous rings are not a complete ring. They're actually cut at the back. So you can have a ring of cartilage that's holding this thing open, right? But because it's cut or slit at the back, that when you contract the smooth muscle between the cartilaginous rings, those leaves will overlap each other and you can get a change in diameter, okay? But it is obstructing our, uh, ourselves a little bit as opposed to those, we didn't have cartilaginous rings in arterioles, we had wicked control over radius. Here we have a little bit less control over radius, but because of the slit at the back of the cartilaginous rings, we still can, we can still change the diameter here. Okay, so the resistance is dictated by all the things that resistance has been dictated by before. Um, the viscosity of what we're bringing in, the length and the number of tubes, eight because eight's fun, and then pi because who doesn't like pi, and then radius to the fourth, okay? So in terms of the viscosity of what we're bringing in here, um, it's air, it's not going to change. The length and the number of tubes, we're not gonna grow tubes um, in order to try to change a problem, so we're gonna get rid of that. We'll also get rid of the, um, the uh, constants in the, in the equation. So at the end of the day, it comes down to, as it did with resistance arterioles, resistance is primarily dictated by radius. Okay, and powerfully, radius to the fourth. Okay, so small changes in radius will result in large changes in resistance and large changes in flow. So at the end of the day, the primary control of resistance uh, is radius and again, powerfully, radius to the fourth. So how are we gonna control this uh, radius? How do we control this smooth muscle? really in between the cartilaginous rings. So we do have direct SNS and PNS uh, innervation into these uh, smooth muscles. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine to, um, I don't even know what that word is, to be able to constrict the trachea. And the sympathetic nerve, we're innervated with the sympathetic nervous system, uses norepinephrine, causes dilation, okay? So we can cause dilation if we use norepinephrine, if we use a beta adrenergic membrane receptor population, right? So you will see tracheal smooth muscle decorated with betas rather than alphas um, in order to get dilation. And because then we've decorated the membrane receptor 
with a beta adrenergic membrane receptor that when the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the adrenal gland and releases epi and norepi, that hormone is going to wander around and find that beta adrenergic membrane receptor population. So stimulate SNS stimulation to the adrenal glands will cause the exact same thing to happen because it's finding the same membrane receptor population. So we've got um, nervous control, we've got hormonal control, a little bit, um, paracrine control, so those epithelial cells, kind of like those epithelial cells are lying right beside the smooth muscle cells kind uh, on the trachea in a very similar fashion to end, how endothelial cells were laying very close to vascular smooth muscle, right? So endothelial cells were releasing products that could affect the smooth muscle. So here we're gonna find epithelial cells, lo and behold, are also releasing products to affect smooth muscle. Now these products are less defined as the endothelial cell products are. Remember we talked about nitric oxide as being a product endothelial cells release. And then we had this whole host of weird stuff called like endothelial derived contracting factors and endothelial derived hyperpolarizing factors because we know they're there, but we haven't identified them yet. So the status of the science here is very similar. So we know that there's something there that, end, that epithelial cells are releasing, but we don't really quite know what it is. So you'll see them um, described as epithelial derived relaxing factors. Okay, so you gotta get your grad school and figure this one out, it's a big hole. In terms of what those epithelial cells are doing and how they're controlling the diameter of the trachea. Um, so nervous, hormonal, paracrine, so all of our normal suspects. We also have a couple of special ones uh, for the trachea. Um, what we breathe in, so the gas that actually comes in can affect the tube. If you were to breathe in nitrous oxide, you would get vasodilation, okay? That's kind of not a normal thing to do, but if you do change the amount of inspired oxygen, you will get a change in diameter. So if the, if the oxygen in the air has increased, let's say you're, you're going to altitude, oxygen in the air starts to drop, you will uh, start to experience uh, a vasodilation of the trachea. So here we see a decrease in oxygen causing vasodilation of that trachea. So what we breathe in might mess with the system a little bit. Transmural pressure, our old friend here is gonna mess with us the entire time we talk about respiration. Critical is that the trachea and all of that tree down to the arterioles or the um, alveoli, which make up the lung tissue itself, are encased in a thoracic cavity, right? That cavity, thoracic cavity has, uh, the walls are the ribs, the bottom of that cavity is the um, diaphragm, and it, they're sealed at the top, okay? So any pressures that go on on the inside of the thoracic cavity are going to be affecting all the things that are, are on the inside of that thoracic cavity. And there's a lots of stuff there other than lungs and trachea, right? The aorta and the vena cava are in there. The heart is in there. So there's lots of things that are in there. They're going to experience changes in pressure if we mess with the thoracic cavity, which we will be doing. So every time you breathe in, you're expanding that thoracic cavity. And we'll talk about how that's actually happening in a minute. But if you expand that thoracic cavity and, cavity and pull it out, everything in that thoracic cavity is being pulled out as well. Right? So I have a trachea that's sitting in there, and if I pull that thoracic cavity out and make it bigger, then that's going to pull everything else out in three dimensions and make them bigger. Right? So if I have a tube sitting in there and I change the transmural pressure and pull everything out, the trachea will be pulled out as well. The trachea will increase its diameter. So every time you breathe in and you make that thoracic cavity bigger, you pull out your trachea or, uh, and increase its radius as well. 
So it's like we have this trachea. Sitting in this thoracic cavity, and every time I breathe in, I will be changing that transmural pressure. Pull it out and increase its radius. And then when I breathe out, when I expire, the whole thoracic cavity will get smaller and you'll get an increase in pressure in this direction. So breathing in will increase that radius and breathing out will, will decrease that radius. So you will flux the size of the trachea every time you breathe in and breathe out. So that's messing with radius a little bit and we'll talk about that phenomenon soon. And then in the last thing that we do have that's special up in the level of the, uh, of the airway in terms of controlling diameter are uh, reflexes. So we do have reflexes that if a foreign particle is brought in, you will normally get um, bronchoconstriction. And the reflex is uh, a cough. Okay, so uh, you'll have this constriction based on this uh, foreign particle being present, and then it's usually followed by a cough. So the attempt here is is to constrict to minimize how far down any foreign particle you breathed in is going, and then a cough in order to try to get it back up the tube. Okay. So the reflex is a vasoconstriction, usually followed by a cough. Which does mean that we have to have some sort of sensor in there and then some sort of quick neural little loop that's going to cause that to happen. Okay. That neural loop can't just be local. Like you had a lot of reflexes when you looked at the um, when you looked at the uh, the gut. A lot of these little neural reflexes in the enteric plexus that caused a lot of stuff to happen. That was all local. Any cough has to actually the reflex has to come up here first because the cough will require you contract your diaphragm and that's got to come from up here. Okay, so that little reflex has to go from. Um, the bronchioles up to the brain, quick down to the uh, to the diaphragm. So it is a little bit bigger. This reflex is going to be a little bit bigger than just some little neural loop that we've placed right at the trachea and the bronchioles all on its own. It's got to be a little bit bigger than that. Okay, so we can control radius. We're not going to have massive control over it, but there's control there. <coughs> all right, so then we in terms of walking through this equation, right? We've thought about resistance. Now we need to think about P1 and P2, okay? So P1 uh, is, P1 is actually atmospheric air. So P1 is the pressure out here. P2 is going to be the pressure in the alveolus because we want air to go from, uh, to flow from out here down into our alveolus. So that's where the pressure drop has to reside. So P1 out here, P2, pressure in the alveolus, okay? So that P1 is atmospheric. Atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And that's gonna be a constant And because it's constant, we commonly set it to zero, right? So we never talk about atmospheric pressure being 760, right? We always set it to zero. We've been setting it to zero ever since we started the course. Every time we talked about mean arterial pressure being 100 millimeters of mercury, right? You know that if you were to cut, don't want to get into this at home, if you were to cut an artery, we would have a pressure difference is so great that blood would come out, right? Spectacular things happening on nighttime television, on any show, 
that has to do with medicine, right? Slash an artery and stuff goes spurting everywhere, right? Well, we talked about it being 100 millimeters of mercury, but if out here is 760 millimeters of mercury, the sh blood shouldn't have come out, right? That's because we always set atmospheric pressure to be zero because it's constant at 760 and we deal with it from there. Right? In fact, mean arterial pressure, it is 100, but it's actually a have 100 over atmospheric. So it's actually 860 millimeters of mercury. But because that 760 is a constant, we wipe it clean and we always talk about uh, it as zero and pressures are described either above and below that. Okay? So it is 760 millimeters of constant, or 760 millimeters of mercury. It is a constant and we set it to zero. This isn't, again, though, something that we do special at the level of the respiration. We set it constant all the time. Problem, though, is, is what it just did to our equation when you set P1 to zero. Okay, if we're gonna set P1 to zero, pressure in the alveolus has to be negative in order to get flow. So we're gonna have to become really comfortable with negative pressures. People are not comfortable with pressures being negative. Okay, people are super comfortable with pressures being positive. We feel them all the time. Okay, positive pressures. When something is pushing against something else, that's positive, right? This is when something is pulling away from something else. As you pull away, what's happening in between is a negative pressure, okay? So we will continue to work on that, but just be alerted right now the negatives are gonna fly, okay? So, if we think about P2, that is pressure in our alveolus. So pressure in our alveoli, it has to be negative for there to be a pressure gradient. It's got to be negative for there to be a gradient for pressure. In order to get flow. So what we are going to do is modify PA in order to get flow in. That's the only thing we can modify. We can't modify atmospheric pressure that's gonna stay constant. So physiologically, the game of foot is how do you change PA in order to get airflow in or out, okay? We've gotta get airflow going in both directions here. So we're gonna see PA change, okay? In order to get airflow in one direction, it's gonna be negative, it's gotta be positive to get it to flow in the other direction, okay? So we are going to modify PA physiologically. So that's the only thing really available to us. Okay, so then the question becomes, how do we change PA? How do we change pressure in the alveolus? So how physiologically do we change PA? All right, so let's then think of the lung, first of all. <clears throat> the lung, the lung tissue are those alveoli. Okay, so those who have taken anatomy and you've looked at your donor and you've got those, you're looking at that pink lung or whatever color it is after embalming. What you're looking at is those millions of alveoli, okay? The lung itself acts as an elastic. It has a pressure volume relationship, okay? And if I were to take a lung, and again, do not try this at home. If I were to take a lung and fill it with volume, fill it with saline instead of air, 
I would get this linear change. If I get an increase in volume, I'm going to get an increase in pressure. If I decrease pressure, I get decreased volume. So it is, it has a pressure volume relationship just like the pressure volume relationships that we've been talking about before. Okay? This is when we have saline in the lungs, you get this, this linear relationship between pressure and volume. So it's behaving like an elastic. And like any elastic, um, let me just pop that down. So the lung is like an elastic, just like any other compartment we've been talking about. And like any elastic, if I take an elastic and I stretch it out, there's strain there, right? Because you can feel that it wants to snap back. And if I were to let it go, it would snap back to a certain length. So the length it's snapping back to is the state at which it is under minimal strain. Okay, it doesn't go shorter than minimal strain because it'll be under strain then. It goes back to a very specific length over and over again. You can take that thing and stretch it out and let it snap back and it will go back to the same length. It's going back to where there is minimal strain. Okay? The lung then is an elastic that has a minimal strain point. You can stretch it out. If you were to stretch it out, let it snap back. It would go back to a length that would house a volume of about one liter. Okay, so our lungs are at minimal strain when they are at filled with one liter of volume. Okay, if you filled them with less, they'd want to pop up to one. If you filled them with more, they'd want to pop back down to one. Minimal strain. That elastic, you let the lungs go, they're going to snap back to one liter. Okay? So the lungs are at a minimum strain when they're filled with one liter of volume. So here, a little picture, we've got that sealed chest cavity that we talked about, that these lungs are housed in, okay? The diaphragm, the chest wall, and then we've sealed these lungs on the inside, that if we were to fill these lungs with something, oh, if we were to bring air in and fill these lungs with something over a liter, it would want to pull back to become one liter, okay? Okay, so that's the lung side of the equation, the lung side of the story. The other side of the story is the chest wall. Okay, so the, the lining out here. The chest wall is also an elastic. It has a pressure-volume relationship, and it will have a spot where there's minimum strain. So, chest wall also acts like elastic. It has a pressure-volume relationship. And it has a minimum strain. At six liters. Meaning that if the, long, if the chest wall was actually compressed down to three liters and you let it go, it would spring out to six. Okay, and if you pulled the chest wall out to eight liters and let it go, it would spring back down to six. Minimal strain, six liters. Okay, so if you compressed that chest wall or that whole chest cavity down, it would want to spring back to be Six liters, minimum strain, okay? So, two, we have two elastics with very different minimum strains. And they are connected, okay? The key here is that they're connected. So, the chest wall and the lung are connected to each other by a fluid layer.
So the fluid layer connecting them, then let's kind of model it like, let's say I've got a chest wall, and we'll just model the lung as one, okay? We know that the chest wall wants to pull out so that its volume is six liters, and that the lung wants to pull in so that it's one liter. So I've got these two, four, and then I've got these, this fluid layer in between the two. So essentially what I've done is I've connected two pieces that are both now pulling in different directions. Okay, they are pulling in different directions. Then the fluid layer is experiencing a negative pressure. Okay, think about the opposite. The opposite will make more sense. If I had two layers that were pushing against each other, we would fully expect that fluid layer to be undergoing a positive pressure, right? But now these two layers happen to be pulling away from each other. So the fluid layer will experience a negative pressure. Okay, so this fluid layer commonly sits at minus four millimeters of mercury when nobody's moving. When nothing is moving and that lung is trying to pull itself back to one liter and the chest wall is trying to pull itself in the other direction to six liters, No elastic is stronger than the other, so they settle on something in between. They settle on three liters. So at rest, while you're not breathing, you have three liters in your lung, your chest, your chest wall wants to pull out to six, your lung wants to pull down to one, and the pressure in the fluid space is minus four millimeters of mercury, okay? So that is our resting normal scenario. Actually, it's minus four centimeters of water. They are the same pressures, just different units. Okay, so then that means, so if I take just a little slice right here, and we think about just that little slice where we've got a little piece of the wall that we're thinking about, we're thinking about that fluid space, and I got a little piece of that chest wall, right? If we think about that little piece for a minute, I've got my fluid layer, I've got my lung pulling in this direction, my chest wall pulling in that direction, meaning that my fluid in between they're going to call this a space. This is catastrophic. There are no spaces in the body. They're always filled with stuff. So there is fluid here. They call it a plural space. But there is fluid. There is pressure in that plural space. And that equals four, millimeters, uh, four centimeters of water. That's at what's called functional residual capacity, where you're, not, where you're neither breathing in nor out. You do that a fair amount of time in a minute. You breathe 12 times a minute. The rest of the time that you're not breathing, you're sitting there at functional residual capacity. The functional residual capacity is three liters, right? Because the lung can't collapse to where it wants to go. The chest wall can't go out up to where it wants to go. They come into some happy medium at three liters in between with a plural pressure of minus four because they're both pulling at that time, okay? So now we go to breathe in. We, uh, inspiration then, and we will talk about how this actually happens soon enough, it involves contracting muscle, right? So you've got this chest cavity, and when you breathe in, you drop the floor. Okay, so if I were to suddenly take this chest cavity and drop the floor, you can see that the space got bigger. 
Okay, so I take that diaphragm and I contract it. The diaphragm is shaped a little bit like this. When you contract it and make the muscle shorter, it pulls down, okay? So it just made the cavity bigger. You've also got muscles in between your ribs that when they contracted, pulled your rib cage, which was kind of, your ribs are uh, at functional residual capacity, kind of slanted down, that when you breathe in, it contracts uh, the muscle between the ribs, uh, sorry, when you contract the muscle between the ribs, it will then bring them up. So you take this cavity, which was this wide, and now it's this wide. So essentially, you're pulling your chest wall out to where it wants to be. You're pulling your chest wall out to minimum strain. You're pulling your chest wall out to six liters, okay? That's what that maneuver's doing. So we've got contracting skeletal muscle. That's what starts the whole thing. And that skeletal muscle is the diaphragm that moves down, makes the thoracic cavity bigger. Intercostal muscles between the ribs move the ridge, rib cage up and out. So we just made that whole cavity bigger, okay? The key is, is that we have the lung attached to that. The lung is attached to that chest wall by that fluid layer. So if we're gonna make the chest wall or, or the cavity bigger, we're going to drag the lungs along with it, okay? Because they're attached. So if we think about our little model that I move my chest wall in the direction it wants to go, Okay, it wanted to go to six liters, so we're headed in that direction. We're making this, we're making the space bigger. All right, so the chest wall will move the direction it wants to go. The lung, though, is further from where it wants to be. If we're going to pull that lung out to six liters, it is not happy. It's taking that elastic, pulling it out a little bit to three, which was normal, and now we're pulling it way out. You know that elastic is pulling back really hard. Right? So the lung is further, further from its minimal strain. It's further from its desired position. Okay, now remember its desired position was one liter. So now that we have um, the lung pulling back so hard from that chest wall, the pleural pressure becomes more negative. We went from a pleural pressure of minus four to a pleural pressure of minus eight, because this is pulling back hard, okay? So pleural pressure is now gonna be eight centimeters of water. Okay, that's happening during a normal inspiration. Your normal inspiration is about 500 mils that you bring in based on this maneuver, and we'll talk about what happened to pressure in the alveolus in a minute. But that's essentially how, or, uh, how we're bringing air in normal breath. You bring air in as a, in a maximal inspiration, right? So in a normal breath, 500 mils. But in a maximum inspiration, you can take your three liter lung and take it to six liters, okay? You can't actually do that maneuver. So what's happening during maximal inspiration, a little bit different. So maximal inspiration, we take in as much air as we possibly can, right? So we've taken the lung really far away from where it wants to be. We'll get a pleural pressure of something even greater. We can then experience the lung um, the pull of the lung as it wants to get back to one liter. You will actually experience the push a push of the uh, 
uh, chest wall, because we've taken the chest, you can take the chest wall beyond six liters. If you take the chest wall beyond six liters, it wants to get back to six. So you can have the pull of the lung in one direction and actually take it beyond six liters so you get a push of the chest wall in the other direction. So you can get pleural pressures to go even more negative based on the pushes and the pulls and where you've taken the chest wall. Has it gone to six liters? So if you take a breath in right now, right, so just here, put your pen down for a minute. Just take a breath in. Take the biggest breath in you can. <gasps> okay, so right there. So hold it for a minute. Now I want you to take a little bit more. It's really hard to hold, isn't it? It's because you've taken the chest wall beyond, okay, breathe out. It's because you've taken the chest wall beyond six liters, right? Your normal breath in, you're not gonna take it beyond six liters. You're just gonna go, oh, perfect. Okay, because it, it's not hard. You took your chest wall to six liters, boom, it's where it wants to be, right? But you take it a little bit beyond that and the chest wall goes, ah, boom, I want six liters. You can tell it starts to get really hard to pull your elastic beyond six liters, which is what you just did. Okay, so try it again. Take a breath in. And now a little bit more. Try to hold that. That's your elastic being pulled beyond six liters. Let it snap back now. There you go. Everything snapped back, right? It snapped back, not so, uh, but it snapped back to a place where nobody's happy. Chest wall, not at six liters. Long, not at one. It snapped back to a place in between. Both are at three, right? But both being at three mean the lung wants to collapse to one. The chest wall wants to expand to six, which means they're both pulling on that fluid space. So you went back to normal when you breathed out to a volume of three liters and a pleural pressure of minus four because both are pulling. Pleural pressure is not alveolar pressure. We're not there yet. Okay, let's be clear. The most common mistake on the test coming up will be a confusion between pleural pressure and alveolar pressure. All we've been talking about up to this point is pleural pressure. The pressure in the space between the chest wall and the lung, okay? All right, let's take a quick break and we'll then start converting that to alveolar pressure, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to expiring. We've been in maximal inspiration there for a little bit. We need to expire. Uh, just a quick correction on the overhead before. Indeed, this is supposed to be negative four centimeters of water. So I'll make that correction there so that doesn't get confusing. All right. <coughs> okay, so we talked about maximal inspiration where we can get ourselves into a situation where we can put our chest wall beyond six liters and actually have it push back on that pleural space. And then if we've gone beyond six liters, then we are really pulling the lung out of its comfy zone, right? So it's really pulling back really hard. So if you've got the chest wall pushing on that space and the lung pulling, you can get yourself into something that's slightly more neg that's more negative than let's say the minus eight that we had under normal inspiration. So pleural pressure will change depending on the amount of inspiration that's happening. So now expiration then is all passive from there. So we started this inspiration. The key to inspiration was changing something physiologically, and that was muscle contraction, right? The key to inspiration was contracting that diaphragm and contracting those skeletal muscles between the ribs to then start to bring the chest wall towards where it wants to be, okay? So the key to inspiration, the physiological maneuver, muscle contraction, okay? Expiration is stopping muscle contraction, okay? So you stop contracting the diaphragm, 
you start contracting the uh, uh, skeletal muscles between the ribs, and the lung is pulling back so hard, that elastic recoil just pulls everything back to three liters. It wants to go to one, but the chest wall wants to go to six, so it's gonna stop at three. So it's the elastic recoil of the lung that brings us back to our normal resting state, okay? So it's the elastic component of the lung. Nothing actively happened. We didn't actively contract muscle to expire. In fact, we stopped muscle contraction. And then that elastic pull that we talked about brings the chest wall back down to that equilibrium spot, that three liters, okay? So during expiration, we will bring ourselves back to that normal spot, lung pulling in one direction, chest wall pulling in the other, pressure in the pleural space equaling minus four. Okay. Essentially, we're sitting there at three liters at rest. You can do forced expiration, without a doubt. You can blow out more of that three liters. And there's other muscles you can contract to do that. But under normal expiration scenario, so every minute you've been doing this, 12 times per minute, contract muscle to breathe in, and then you stop contracting the muscle, and boom, breathing out automatically happens, okay, because of that elastic recoil. You can blow more out, and there are muscles there to do that, but that's not normal expiration. Okay, so critical here is that we have, what we've been talking about is changing, we contracted muscle, and we changed volume of the system, right? Because I just said things kept going from three liters to six liters, so we changed volume. And what we saw along with that was a change in that pleural pressure, that pressure associated with the uh, fluid in the space between the lung and the chest wall. That's all we've been talking about so far. Okay, so be clear that what we've been talking about is that change in volume, we started out at functional residual capacity, so where you're not breathing, and then you started to contract muscle, expanded the um, chest wall out, increasing the volume, okay, under normal resting breathing conditions, right, so sitting there, quiet breathing, 500 mils would have come in. Okay, so we would increase, during inspiration, we would increase the volume of the system. And during that time, because we were pulling the chest wall out and the lung was pulling back harder and harder and harder, then our pleural pressure dropped. We went from minus four to minus eight. Okay, that's where we were playing. Pleural pressure is not alveolar pressure. Let's be clear. And then when you expired, you stopped breathing. You, changed, you put that, vo the, the lung recoil brought that volume back to three liters. And your pleural pressure went back up to minus four. Okay, so that was that inspiration, expiration maneuver. That was that little box diagram that we just walked through. This is just a graph showing the exact same information. Okay. What that did then for us, though, is change pressure in the alveolus. Okay, that was the whole game afoot, right? Is that we needed to change P2. Okay, we talked about this being atmospheric. And that we set it to zero. And that P2 was alveolar pressure. Okay, so in order us, for us to bring it in, it had to have gone negative. Okay, so during that maneuver, think about you're in alveolus now, okay. which is now just a s one two millionth or three millionth of that lung tissue that we talked about pulling out. 
what were we pulling out when the lung got pulled out? We were pulling out every alveolus. Every one of those little grapes was being pulled out in three dimensions, right? That's what the lung tissue is. It is three million of those little things. So every time, so when we inspired and we pulled the lung along with the chest wall, we pulled every little alveolus out in three dimensions. So we took a balloon that was sitting there, a little bit blown up, and we pulled it out. What would happen if you had a balloon and you pulled it out in three dimensions? Where would air go? It would be sucked in, right? Because pulling it out in three dimensions created a slight negative pressure on the inside and air moved from out to in to the little balloon, okay? We had 300 little balloons that we just pulled out. We created a slight negative pressure when we did that and then air moves down a pressure gradient, okay? The slight negative pressure that we created in that alveolus During inspiration went to negative one. Negative one. That number scares me all the time. It scares me as much as the kidney scares me. Negative one. Bringing oxygen on board into your bloodstream is dictated by one centimeter of water pressure, which is one millimeter of mercury. Pressure doesn't, we just need a pressure drop it doesn't have to be a big one, all right? That's how tenuous this relationship between flow and pressure is. We just need to change pressure by one millimeter of mercury or one centimeter of water, they're the same thing, and we're gonna get flow, okay? So that maneuver, pulling the chest wall out, pulled the every alveoli out, created a slight negative pressure on the inside, okay? Now pressure does go to negative one, but not at, until it doesn't go, it goes to negative one, but only halfway through inspiration, right? It goes to negative one only halfway through inspiration because then you start to move volume in and you start to fill that. So then pressure goes back up to zero. And I can prove this, okay? So breathe in just a little bit, breathe in and then keep your throat open. Okay, so breathe in a little bit, keep your throat open. So volume's not moving, right? You're breathing in, you're at the height of inspiration, and there's no air movement because there's no pressure gradient. So air did move in. You can breathe out now. Air did move in as you inspired, but then, uh, so you change pressure, air moved in, and at the end of inspiration, there's no more pressure drop. So there's no more volume moving, okay? No more pressure drop, no more volume moving. You need this or else you would just continue to expand and expand and expand and expand, right? So the pressure goes from minus two, from zero to minus one as you do that maneuver to pull it out. Air then moves in, right, to, to then now there's no negative pressure anymore, back to zero, to a point where there's no flow moving, no pressure drop, no flow moving. That's at the end of inspiration, right? At expiration then, we stop contracting muscle, and then the lung starts to pull back. So now we take that slightly enlarged balloon and we start pushing it, right? So if we had an enlarged balloon with air in it and you pushed on it, where would the air go? Out. Because you created a slight positive pressure on the inside, and now you're moving air out. Okay, so expiration is reliant on a slight positive pressure as the chest wall, uh, as the lung starts to recoil and pull back on those three million little balloons, creating a positive pressure, create a positive pressure, air flows out. Okay, midway through, inspiration is our highest positive pressure, but because now we're moving air out, that pressure then by the end of expiration goes back down to zero. And you can prove that, because when you're not breathing right now, 
Don't breathe in, just sit there. But open your throat. There's no air moving, because there's no pressure drop. It's the end of expiration, and you're waiting between, the, between breaths, so there's no, pre, there's no air moving. Okay, so we can prove that at the end of inspiration, there's going to be no pressure drop uh, and no flow, and at the end of expiration, there's going to be no pressure drop, no flow. Okay? So, we changed volume and pleural pressure, and that resulted in a change in alveolar pressure. We got to keep all of these pressures separate. Remember where we're living pleural pressure. That's the fluid space between the lung and the chest wall. Alveolar pressure, the pressure in each of the little alveolar sacs. Okay, they are measuring two different spots. Okay. When you're thinking about these pressures, think about what compartment you're sitting in. Are you sitting in the alveolus? Or are you sitting between the wall, uh, the chest wall and the lung? Okay, so try to keep those two ideas separate. All right, so we can then physiologically change alveolar pressure. We can make it slightly negative and slightly positive depending on what direction we need to move air, in or out. Okay? So we can move air. It's a good day. Let's just think a little bit about those volumes that we can move then, because we've been throwing words around already, like functional residual capacity. So this is just a... Uh, would have been a data set taking off, taking off what's called a spirometer, where folks breathe in and out and um, measure uh, volumes of each different types of breath. So um, we've been talking about functional residual capacity, and that is the air in the lung at the end of expiration. You never expire all the volume from your lung. There's always a volume sitting in there. Okay, so that's going to be around... It's around three liters we were talking about, okay? You can breathe out more than that functional residual capacity. So if, you ha if you're at the end of a breath right now, do a maneuver so that you blow more air out. Right? So you know you can contract muscle. <laughs> breathe out as much air as you possibly can. Right? So you know you can contract muscle to breathe out as much air as you possibly can. Right? So you can, you do have this reserve volume but at the end of the day, you can't blow it all out. Even if you pushed as hard as you possibly could to bring as much air out of those lungs as you possibly could, you will always have a residual volume. It'll always be about a liter. You can't get rid of it. Mostly because that's where the lung wants to be. The lung wants to be at that liter, right? You would have to compress the lung to be shorter than where it wants to be. And any time um, you, and you probably have experienced this, that when you have a, an alveoli that's open like a little sack, and then we change the, volu uh, change the pressure in it by a millimeter or a cent uh, centimeter of water back and forth, that's a very easy maneuver to do. If you stick those two membranes together, if I were to collapse that little alveola by putting, by taking all my air out, pulling those two apart are super hard, right? It's like when you're in first playing with microscopes and you stuck two slides together with fluid. You can't get those suckers apart, right? The physics of separating two membranes is very difficult. You might have experienced this if anybody's ever been winded. Have you ever been winded like you've fallen, right? If you've fallen and you've been winded, that means more air went out than should have and you collapsed. Now that first breath that you breathe in after being winded is brutally hard. The panic that ensues as you try to breathe in, but nothing's coming because it takes so much work, it takes so much contraction to separate those two layers, right? That's an amazing amount of work. We can't have that work of breathing the whole time. Right, so what we do is we just make sure we keep a liter in there the whole time so that those sacs can get smaller but not compressed. And we can open and close them, okay? All right, we'll cut it there for today.